This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 32, The Radioactive Boy Scout, Part 1. Hello, everyone. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Virila, your heuristic host, and thanks for being here. Hey, did you know, before I get into the story, did you know we're on iTunes? Yeah, check us out there and feel free to give us a rating so more people can listen to us. Also, if you have a haiku or show idea, go ahead and send me an email at contact at incrediblestoriespodcast.com. So, what are we learning today, Josh? Well, today will be part one of two of a charming adventure. And for this, I'll be bringing you back to the 90s for a story involving a Boy Scout, a nuclear reactor, and a government agency or two. You see, a 17-year-old kid named David Hahn was dead set to build his very own nuclear reactor in his mother's shed in the quaint town of Commerce Township, Michigan. Here's what I know. The year was 1994, a time when Boys to Men and similar R&B groups reigned supreme with their songs of needing love, grinding, and losing love. Commerce Township is a suburb about 30 miles northwest of Detroit. It is hardly a location you would expect a mad scientist to live, but it is probably what you would imagine as any middle class suburban area of the country to be. A real slice of Americana. And few things are as American as a Boy Scout. But before we get to the main event, let's rewind a little here. As a young boy, David Hahn had been enamored with chemistry for quite some time. By all accounts, he was a typical American boy, playing baseball and he had friends, which I assume they did normal friend things like searching for One-Eyed Willie's treasure or defending their turf against rival Sandlot gangs. But he did grow up in a split family. His father, Ken, and mother, Patty, divorced when he was only a few years old. He lived with his father and stepmother Kathy in the nearby Clinton Township, and he went and spent weekends and holidays with his mother and her boyfriend, Michael. Now, around 10 years old, David got a gift called the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments, and this book is a children's chemistry book from the 1960s. Many people in the world of chemistry today had been exposed to chemistry through this book, And this book really piqued David's interest. It had instructions on how to set up a lab and conduct experiments ranging in levels of difficulties. And I think this is really where David got hooked on the whole chemistry thing. You see, he had this obsession with one day collecting samples of every element on the periodic table, even the radioactive ones. That's admirable, you know, it sounds like a fun little hobby to pass time. But by 12, he was moving on to more advanced books like his father's college chemistry books, which he absorbed easily. His father, incidentally, was an automotive engineer at GM. Now, it wasn't uncommon for David's mother to find him passed out after a long night on a knowledge bender surrounded by Encyclopedia Britannica's... Oh, let me explain to the younger generation here. Encyclopedia Britannica was like Wikipedia. Before the internets, people had to look at books or a series of books arranged alphabetically that had comprehensive summaries of different topics in it. They weighed about a million pounds and took up an entire row on your bookshelf. But David was full on board with learning this chemistry thing, and he even had a lab set up in his bedroom at his father's house. Now, David had other books in his collections, like this one called The Prudent Practices of Handling Hazardous Chemicals in Laboratories. Sounds like a stimulating read. Originally, this book was published in 1981. I, on the other hand, around the same age, had copious volumes of zoo books and Ranger Rick magazines in my bedroom. So, you know, pretty much the same level. 
So David was pretty much setting up his own Dexter's laboratory, complete with test tubes, Bunsen burners, and other various lab essentials. Now you think, Josh, this doesn't seem so out of the ordinary. Lots of young boys are into chemistry. Ah, but David wasn't doing cute things like dropping Mentos into Coke. By age 14, David had successfully made nitroglycerin. And if you're up on your Looney Tunes, you know nitroglycerin to be highly explosive. So explosive, it will blast your duck bill onto the other side of your head. Nitroglycerin is an explosive liquid that is very, very, very unstable. Well, as you can imagine, a bedroom is no place for a science lab. However, his parents encouraged his interest in science, but because of the damaged walls and carpets in the bedroom, his father had him relegated to the basement for all future chemical spills and small explosions. Now, David got a little bit older and started working after school at various types of places typical for teenagers to get some extra spending money, like fast food restaurants, furniture warehouses, grocery stores, etc. But his extra spending money all went to bankrolling his science experiments. Oddly, Despite his proclivity for science experiments, he wasn't a great student. In fact, he almost failed math and reading tests required to graduate. Although his science tests were easy for him, as you can imagine, he just aced those. And you'll probably find this habit in a lot of people who excel in certain aspects. School disinterests them, and as a result, their grades reflect that. But David was in no way stupid. As David did more and more science experiments, he had less time for friends because he was busy sciencing. He did have himself a girlfriend though. I couldn't confirm if she was made from plastic tubes and pots and pans and bits and pieces and bits and pieces, pieces, pieces. Clearly by now, his science enthusiasm was beginning to become more and more apparent. And one particular time, he was researching artificial tanning, as teenage boys do, and he was taking a substance called canthaxanthin, which is a pigment found in things like crustaceans, fish, mushrooms, etc. And what happens if you eat a lot of this, it makes you turn kind of orangish. It simulates a tan, I suppose, but weirder looking. I think it's fairly harmless, but that's the side effect of an overdose from it, which I assumed earned David his carrot face badge at a scout meeting. Well, this greatly surprised his fellow scout people, but this wasn't his first science incident at scouts. Once David brought a bunch of powdered magnesium on a campout to make his own fireworks, as one does and his fellow scouts ignited it in a communal tent, burning a big hole in it. Whoops! And another time while at scout camp, he stole a bunch of smoke detectors because he wanted to cannibalize the parts for his science experiments. You know, as one does. This got him kicked out of the summer camp early, which ruined his father and stepmother's summer vacay. Oh well, kids will be kids, right? Okay, so now David's science behaviors were becoming grander and more problematic. So his father and stepmother thought he was going all breaking bad and concocting drugs to sell. They followed up on David, making sure he was at the library when he said he was. FYI, he wasn't making or selling drugs. And he was always at the library when he said he was going to be there. What a good kid! Just sitting at the library like a huge nerd surrounded by chemistry books and other library bookworms. But his parents' paranoia continued to grow, to the point that they were scared that David would blow up their house from a failed experiment. Okay, perhaps this fear wasn't so paranoid as justified, but still. His father and Kathy wouldn't allow David to be alone in the house. They would lock him out when they would leave the house, either for work or to run down the street to the grocery store. Kathy would search David's room and confiscate any chemicals or science things she found. But you can't stop David's thirst for science! You can only hope to contain it! Welcome back, sports fans. I'm Jimmy McGoozle. And if you're just joining us, this has been an epic match between David's science brain and his stepmom, Kathy. Here, Skip Frantic with the call. And David has made a beautiful concoction for a 4th of July fireworks display. 
Big bagging looms with this one. Oh, but here comes Kathy. She's found his chemical stockpile and promptly throws it in the trash. Amazing defense from Kathy. Ouch. The home team seems to love that one. But here comes David back hiding instruments under his mattress. A great hiding place for any teenage boy. Oh, wait. Kathy is on to this. She goes in, flips his mattress, discovering the banned items, and throws them in the trash. Yes! That's why they call her the Trash Compactor. Oh, now Kathy goes on offense and inspects the closet. What does she find? No, she's got the Bunsen burner. And the crowd goes wild. Yes, you can hear them chant. Throw it out. Throw it out. And she hears them. She throws it out. The Trash Compactor strikes again. What's this? It looks like Kathy is locking David out of the house while they are at home. Genius! David looks on the ropes. Wait, David still has an ace up his sleeve. He can still perform his experiments in the basement while his parents are at home. And it looks like, yes, he's pounding away at some red phosphorus. And look at him go. And look at him go. He might go. Oh, the... And boom goes the dynamite. It's over. Game over. David's science brain prevails. So, yeah. David, one night, was experimenting with some red phosphorus, which is fairly stable compared to his brethren white phosphorus. But it can be dangerous in certain combinations and if exposed to enough heat, say 500 degrees Fahrenheit, when it gets that hot, it will ignite, and if combined with things like chlorine or sodium, it will explode. I'm not exactly sure what experiment David was doing, but he had been hitting it with a screwdriver which caused it to explode. This shook the house, and when Ken and Kathy investigated, they found David lying on the ground half-conscious with his eyebrows on fire. Oh, David. They then took David to the hospital, and he had to have his eyes flushed out Incidentally, he would make frequent trips to have pieces of plastic removed from his eyes. <sighs> he wasn't blinded though. But this did get him banned from sciencing at his dad's house. No biggie, David said. He just moved his lab to his mother's house in Commerce Township. Now, Patty and her boyfriend thought David was just wonderful pursuing his science experiments. They weren't so much familiar with all his hazardous experimental side. So David set up shop in the potting shed behind his mother's house. Now his mother and her boyfriend Michael weren't as science savvy as David's father and his new wife Kathy, who were both automotive engineers. They would see David wearing gas masks and disposing his clothes after experiments, but didn't think much of it as they figured David just knew a lot more than they did about science stuff. Which he did. When David would try to explain to Patty and Michael what he was doing, it just went over their heads. They did know David was trying to create energy, which they thought was good because one day we would run out of oil, so good for the lad. And even though David's dad knew more about science, David was getting even beyond what his father knew just from his college chemistry books. So his father, Ken, just thought that David was exaggerating what he was actually doing in his experiments. Okay, so at this point, Ken's father figured David just needed a new goal to focus his attention on to dampen these crazy experiments. And since David was a Boy Scout and of the appropriate age, it was time for him to go for Eagle Scout, which is the highest rank in the Boy Scouts. Now, Eagle Scout is a big deal in the Scouts apparently, and only 4% of Boy Scouts reach this rank. And part of getting this rank is earning 21 merit badges. David had many badges, but needed some additional ones to reach Eagle Scout. Oddly enough, one such a badge he could select was the Atomic Energy Badge. And David was probably the only boy in his geographic region to select this merit badge as one to complete for Eagle Scouts. Here are some of the requirements David completed to get this badge. He made a drawing showing how nuclear fission happens. He built a 3D model of a reactor and visited a hospital's radiology unit. There are more things that you need to do, but I'll link these in the show notes if you want to see what it takes to earn this badge. 
I'll link two sites. One is from the 1991 qualifications, and the other is more updated. So David received this merit badge five months shy of his 15th birthday. And what does a typical teenager do after getting this badge? Well, I'm not sure. But David decided now was the time to start trying to build a nuclear reactor. And I think this is a good place to end part one of this episode. Don't worry, there's plenty of story left, so make sure to check out next week for part two, where I'll detail David's building of the reactor, what happened when authorities discovered his laboratory, and what became of David. But before I go, let me irradiate you with a haiku! Boy Scouts are prepared, but to prepare for the Scouts, get a hazmat suit. And that's all the time this week. I do want to say a big thanks to Vinnie Dawson who provided the Weird Science Trumpet cover. And if you like that, check out some of his other stuff at VinnieDawson.com. I'll link his site in the show notes for you. But do make sure to check out our main site for other stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku, show suggestion at contact at IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh, and remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word. Choose a